Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. and We receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you for all that you bring forth this night. We'll be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. The last two messages we talked about obedience. Obedience to the word. Obedience in all things. It's all many scriptures where God wants us to obey from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Tonight we're going to take it from a little bit different aspect, and that's regarding your will. Because with your will, you are going to choose, and you are to choose to obey God's Word and to follow Him. You are to set your will to obey the Word of God. There's a war that will go on against your will, trying to get you not to make the proper choice. But you need to get strong in your will that you will choose the way of the Lord. God has given us a free will, and He set before us, as we see in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Not only does it affect you, but it affects your inheritance line, your seed. Your choices are important. God has given you a free will. Of course, He tells us to choose life. Choose life, choose blessing the right way. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God. Notice all the effects of your right choices. That thou mayest obey his voice. Thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of days. That thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. And it's the land that you and I enter into, the spiritual promised land, as we possess the promises of God in our life. Now you must understand you are made of three parts. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, the whole person. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you receive Jesus and you get born again, what happens? You're born from above. You get a brand new spirit. It is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You are a new creation. So your spirit now is right with God. How about your body? Your body does not get changed. And sin dwells in your body. You can never walk by what your body wants you to do. The, the voice of the body is the feelings. And it also has a will or a desire that comes from it. You can never yield to it because sin is dwelling in your body. Instead, you're going to walk according to the Word of God which is the way of the Spirit in line with your spirit. But you also have a soul. Your soul is made up of your will, your intellect, the way you reason and mind and think, and also in your emotions, the way you feel. That's where the battleground is. The enemy is trying to get to your will so that you would choose the wrong things. He tries to work through your mind so you have thoughts that are coming from him instead of the thoughts that come, thoughts are coming from the devil instead of the thoughts that come from God. And he tries to work through your emotions, what you feel. Well, you can't give place to anything that comes from your emotions. Your emotions are almost always going to draw you away from doing the things of the Lord. So, the battleground is in the area of the soul. And especially, he's after your will to make wrong choices. You must understand you have authority over your will. The lying teaching has gone forth thinking that God's in control of all things and whatever happens is of Him is an abominable teaching that has gone forth in the body of Christ. It has deceived so many thinking that God must be in control of everything that's happening when that's not the truth. He's given us a free will. Remember, we can choose life or death, blessing or cursing. So our choice determines what happens. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 37 reveals something. Nevertheless, he has standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but notice the next part, but hath power. The word power is the word exousia, which means authority. Authority over his own will. You have authority over your own will. And in this case, he says, he hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin and doeth well. He's not going to get into sexual sin. He's doing well. He's got authority. It means your will can make the wrong choice. And you need to decree things in your heart that I am going to choose the way of the Lord. 
but the battle will be there against your will. But you've got authority over your own will. So you never can say, the devil made me do it. The devil influenced you, but he didn't make you do it. You chose to do it. You have the choice. Make sure that you understand that. You have authority over your own will. So we can't cast it off on any other th reason. We can't pass the buck. You know, we can't have all these other excuses. No. You have a will. God expects you to choose the way of the Lord. We need willingness, a willing heart and a willing mind. We see in Exodus chapter 35, verse 5, Take ye from among you an offering of the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart, and let him bring it. An offering of the Lord, gold, silver, and brass. Notice, it was to be of a willing heart. If you have your will set right, you're going to choose to want to do what God wants you to do. You're not going to do things because I ought to or have to. If you're doing things because you ought to or you have to, there's a problem. Now, we are to do things with a willing heart and also a willing mind. In 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9, God's speaking here to Solomon. He says, Thou Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the imagination of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he'll be found of thee. If thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Quite a statement. We need to have a perfect heart and a willing mind, a willing heart, to choose the way of the Lord. Remember, the battle is going on in this soulish realm. And Paul is really addressing this problem when we come to Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, we pick up in verse 15. <coughs> verse 15, Paul says, For that which I do, I allow not. Means I, I, I know, I, I don't, this isn't what I want to do, my, according to my knowledge. For what I would, or this is the word fellow in the Greek, what I will, that I do not. But what I hate, that do I. The things that I'm willing and wanting to do, I'm not doing. The things that I don't want to do, I hate to do, yet I'm doing them. If then I do that which I will not, more literally, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now then it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Because he says, I don't want to do this. Speaking about the man of the spirit, the hit man on the inside. But he says, there's something else dwelling in me that's working, causing me to do this. Sin is dwelling in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, now he's identifying where in him. Not in his spirit, but in his flesh, in that body. Dwelleth no good thing. You can never trust your flesh. Never. For to will is present with me. I got the will. I want to do the right thing. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. He's got a real battle going on. For the good that I will to do, <clears throat> I do not. But the evil that I will not to do, that I do. Now if I do that I will not, again, no more that I do it, but sins dwelling in me, he reiterates this. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil's present with me. I can want to choose to do good, yet I got evil working at the same time. Why is that? Because your body has evil dwelling in it, sin dwelling in it and it does not want to do what is right. That's why you must always deny yourself and crucify the flesh every day and not give place to your feelings or any desires of the flesh or mind, anything that's contrary to the Word of God. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. The inward man, remember you've got a new spirit, a new heart? You've got that inward man, and he wants to do what is right at all times. So he goes on and says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law in my mind, and the battleground's going in my mind, what I think, to try to get to your will to choose wrong things. And it's bringing me into captivity, the law of sin that's in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So the key will be, you got to get your mind renewed to the Word so that then you think, what does the Word say in this situation? And then your will will be able to choose to do the right thing. 
You'll choose life. You'll choose blessing instead of choosing the wrong way. It is mandatory for you to get the word in your mind so that you will make the proper choice because God's given you a free will and you're expected to choose the right way. We see over in Matthew, interesting statement that Jesus made in chapter 23, in verse 37. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killeth the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee? But this is again, when he talks about what I've gathered you, this is a gathering together. He willed to get them to be gathered together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and they would not. They willed not. Fellow, they didn't want to do it. They were resistant because they didn't make the proper choice. You've got to make the right choice. If you don't make the right choice, then you resist God. You refuse Him. You rebel against Him. You allow the devil to have place. And that's how people get into bondage. In fact, Jesus really told them what was what in John chapter 8, in verse 44. You're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you, when it says will do, will is the main verb in this statement, because it's an indicative, if you aren't here, never heard us talk about this, we talk about the tense voice and mood, which is important to understand, and we explain it. The indicative mood is a mood of a statement of fact or reality, the main statement in a clause. The word do, is, as you will see, is an infinitive. It's not the main word in there. It's an infinitive. You kind of lose it in the English translation here because you will do, you think will is just kind of a helper verb for do from our English understanding, but it's not what it is. That's why Young's translates it correctly. You will to do. That's what it's literally saying. The lust of your father you will to do these things. Otherwise, you want to do them. You have a desire to do them. You will to do these things. He really told them off here. He's a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He's a liar and a father. You cannot allow yourself to yield to the devil. These guys were willing to do what the, the father, his, their, their father, which was the devil, walk according to the lusts of their father. And we see over in Ephesians, chapter 2, makes this statement, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Satan is over this world, given into his hands because of Adam's sin. According to the ruler, the prince means the ruler, of the authority, exousia, of the air. He's the ruler of the authority of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all, every one of us, were under his dominion until we got born again. We all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh. We're run by the flesh. Fulfilling the desires. This is the word thelema, which means the will. It's from the word thelo the will of the flesh and of the mind. The will of the flesh is going to be doing what I want, contrary to God's word, walking in sin. But there's also a will of the mind, that's the carnal mind, as opposed to the spiritual mind. So you can have a carnal mind in one area and spiritual mind in another, depending upon how your mind's renewed to the word. And if you don't have your mind set on the word, you'll be operating according to the will of the flesh affecting your mind, the will of a mind, a carnal-minded attitude. That's why we've got to make sure we get the word in us and we don't yield to the things that God that doesn't want us to yield to. Never yield your will to the devil. Yield your will to the word to choose what is right. Never yield your will to the lusts of the flesh. You cannot allow that to happen or you yield to sin. It's also interesting in Acts chapter 9, 
Acts chapter 9, when, when Saul got converted on the road to Damascus, and here is what he says what, after what the Lord said to him. And he said back to him, He trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? What is your will for you, for you, that you have for me to do? What did, how did the Lord respond? Did he say, well, I will for you to do such and such? No, he didn't. He said, arise and go in the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And that tells you something. He was saying, my will is towards you to want to do the things you want me to do. And God responded and said, well, that's great. Because what should your will be set for? To do what you must do what's necessary, what is mandatory. Necessary is binding according to the covenant. That tells you something. You and I are to get ourselves renewed in our mind, and we are to set our will for doing the things that we must do. That's what Paul understood from that. Oh, I must do, not like what his will for me is. What his will for me is what I must do. The will of God is what you and I must do. We can't walk in our own ways. We're not to live unto ourselves. remember. We're to live unto Him. You're bought with a price. You're a purchased possession. You're not your own. You belong to Him. And you are told, yield yourself unto the Lord and do what He wants you to do. We come over to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your responsibility to do this, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. That's your reasonable service. You're to present your body holy. How can I present my body holy when it's got sin in it? You don't give place to it. You don't let sin operate. If you don't let sin operate, then you'll present it as a holy vessel because you're not yielding to any kind of sin. You're not going to let it function in it. You're to be a holy, acceptable unto God. It's like a living sacrifice. You make your body your slave. And you tell your body what to do. We're going to do the things that are in line with the Word of God. That's your reasonable service. This is why, and we talked about this the last time we're together, but we need to go over it again. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Well, if we back up to verse 12, it says this, Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You are dead to sin. Why am I dead to sin? Because the old you is dead and gone. There's a brand new you on the inside. Remember what it says here? Romans 6, 7, He that's dead is freed from sin. You're brand new. Where are you come from? From heaven. Remember, you're a citizen of heaven. Your spirit has come from heaven. Therefore, as he says, you're dead to sin. You're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he says, let not sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it and lust thereof. It's kind of watered down the way the King James says it, because when it says this statement, it is not just saying, let such and such be, no, it's an imperative mood verb. The imperative mood in the Greek is the mood of command. It's also a present tense verb, which is the a tense that means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So what it says essentially is this, a command. Do not ever continually let, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you might obey it in the lust thereof. See, you don't have to obey it. You'd have to yield it to obey this thing continually and to yield it or you, to obey this thing. You know, you can't be obeying it whatsoever, ever, in the lust thereof. And then he goes on in verse 13. It's another command when he says, Neither yield your members of instruments of unrighteousness. This word yield here again is a commanding statement. It's an imperative mood. Present tense again. Again, it's literally saying, do not continually or ever yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves. And again, this is a command as well. 
imperative mood. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And you're, what are you to yield? yield also? Your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. God wants you to yield yourself to God. How do you do that? You do that with your will because you choose to do what God wants. You yield yourself to Him. You can yield yourself to the devil or you can yield yourself to God. You can yield yourself to something that's righteous or you can yield yourself to something that's unrighteous. It's all the choice at the point of your will. God wants us to make sure we're choosing the right thing. Of course, sin is, shall not have dominion over you anymore. We come to verse 16. Know ye not to whom, that's a person, you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Otherwise, you're a servant of a person, of a, of a personality. And who would that be if you yield to sin? You'd be yield, obeying the devil unto death. That's what it produces. Or of obedience, who would we be yielding to then? We'd be yielding to God. Obedience to the Word. And what does that do? That produces righteousness. How do you get to have righteousness? It's through obedience to the Word of God. If you're not obedient to the Word, you don't have any righteousness. You're not going to have any fruits of righteousness. It comes because of you doing the Word of righteousness in your life. We come down to verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity or weakness of your flesh, as you have now yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to lawlessness. The word iniquity means lawlessness, it's an anomia, unto producing more lawlessness, which it does. Even so now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. How do we get to the place of holiness? Because of righteousness. How do we get to the place of having righteousness? because of obedience. As you're obedient to the Word of God, it produces fruits of righteousness, and those fruits of righteousness produce holiness in your life. God wants us to set our will that we are going to obey the Word of God. So it produces fruits of righteousness to produce holiness in our life. We need to set our will that we're going to choose the things God wants. Luke chapter 10. We pick up over in verse 38. This is where Jesus, dealing with Martha and Mary, came to pass as they went, they entered into a certain village. A certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Good choice. Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are careful, you're anxious, and you're troubled about many things. You're not supposed to be. You're supposed to have your eyes on the Lord. One thing is needful, he says. One thing is needful. Mary hath chosen that good part, which is what? To sit at the Master's feet and to hear his word. What do you need to do? Hear the word of God so that you get your mind renewed to the truth and then your will choosing to do the things that God wants. And notice, it shall not be taken away from her. You need to put your, the Word of God first place in your life. Hear the Word. You know, when you get born again, what's the first thing you should be doing? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes, you're brand newborn, desire, long for, the pure, unmixed, sincere milk of the Word. What does a baby need? Milk right away, so he grows. What do you need? Spiritual milk of the Word of God, so you begin to grow in the things of God. You begin to learn who you are in Christ, and you begin to get the Word in you that's going to spiritually strengthen you and feed you and bring revelation to you. Psalms chapter 1, verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In His law does He meditate day and night. God wants you to get the Word in you and know the Word. You need to delight in the Word of God and meditate in it day and night. What's going to be the result of that? You'll be like a plea, a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's what you'll be like. You're going to be bringing forth fruit. You're going to be not withering whatsoever. And you're going to be prospering in the things that you do. In fact, 
God wants you to delight greatly in the commandments of the Lord. Psalms 112, verse 1. Praise you the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord that delights greatly in his commandments. You delight greatly in his commandments, you're going to be choosing his commandments. You want the commandments of the Lord because you know they're teaching you the right way to walk in. His seed, what's going to happen to the guy who delights greatly in, and, and has the fear of the Lord? His seed's going to be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness will be enduring forever. All these great things are going to happen for you because you have the fear of God and you delight greatly in the commandments of the Lord. Now remember, you have a will. You need to choose the right things. We see in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Notice that. You're to choose the things that please God. Don't choose things that don't please God. Stay away from those things. Take hold of the covenant. Choose the things that God wants. That's what he's looking for. We see another place. You need to choose to serve the Lord. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, look what he says. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the decision you need to make. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, and that's it. We're not going to serve anything else but walking in the ways of the Lord. Which means you're going to have to stand up against anything that is not of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 7. Verse 15. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. When evil comes, refuse it, reject it. Do not have anything to do with it. Choose the good. Always choose the right way, the things that God wants. And of course, that's going to be the way of the word in every situation. Psalms 119 speaks of this. Psalms 119 and verse 30, he says this, I have chosen the way of truth. That's what you should be choosing, the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. You're not going to choose any other way but the way of truth. That is the only way that is going to lead to eternal life. Psalms 173, let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. Why should God help you? Why is his hand going to help you? Because you made the right choice. I've chosen thy precepts. The word precepts is a word which refers to, when you study it out, it refers to the rules of action, conduct, and behavior according to a written law that are responsibilities that God requires of his people. And he expects you to do them. Because remember, we're, we're under the New Testament law of Christ and we are to choose the way of the Lord and do the things he wants. At the same time, hey, the enemies, they're going to try to hinder you. Hebrews chapter 11. You've got to always be ready to choose the right thing in the face of anything that comes against you. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He had it made. Uh, nope, not going to we'll go that direction. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Oh, sin's got its pleasures, but it's only for a season because, again, you're giving place to the devil and the destruction comes in and curses come upon you and demons come into you. Don't make the mistake of wanting to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You're going to pay the price big time. Suffer affliction instead. He says, I'll suffer this Affliction with the people of God, the pressure that comes against you. You will have affliction. Remember, all those that are living for the Lord, they're going to have pressure that is going to come against them, every single person. And you're going to go through much pressure if you're going to enter into the kingdom. Remember the scripture in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, and we talked about what we must do, the must message. 
confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, much pressure, enter into the kingdom of God. The pressure will come. Don't be moved by it. Just know it's going to happen. Jesus was tempted in all points, yet without sin. You will have the pressure. You've got to be ready to deal with the pressure that comes against you. And it's trying to get to your will, to make, give place to the devil, make wrong choices, yield to things that are not of the Lord. Of course, that's why you have to stay away from the things of this world and choose what pleases God. Your will is so important. Obedience because of the fact that you make the proper choices. We saw this before, but we need to look at it again. In Proverbs 1.23. He says, turn you at my reproof. That's his correction. What's going to happen? When you respond to what God tells you to do, a good thing's going to happen. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you. Oh, the Holy Spirit's going to be manifesting himself to you, and you're going to get revelation of the, of the word. Because I've called and you refused, I've stretched out my hand, no man regarded. You said it not all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I will laugh at your calamity and I'll mock when your fear cometh. Why would all those things come? Because you're not walking in God's ways, which means you're choosing something else, giving place to the devil, and he's going to come in and bring calamities and all kinds of destruction. And God is not going to respond just because you have a problem. He does not respond because of the, pro pro the wrong choices you've made. He responds when you get right with him and choose to do what he wants you to do. Confess your sin, repent, have a godly sorrow that turns away from it. He's not a God who responds just because you have a problem. If that's the case, everybody on the face of the earth would have God working for them because they got all kinds of problems. <laughs> but most all of them, they're all in bondage because they're not choosing the way of the Lord, unfortunately. When your fear comes as desolation, your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Who's bringing that? The devil. Then they shall call upon me and I'll not answer. I wonder why God's not answering my prayers. Well, have you dealt with all the sin areas in your life yet? No, I'm just trying to get out of my problems. You're going to go nowhere. He's not going to respond. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. You cannot be calling upon him and seeking on him if you have not dealt with your sin and turned away from it, confessed the sin, had godly sorrow that works repentance. They hated knowledge. They cast the word behind their back. Did not choose the fear of the Lord, which is to hate evil, and to choose to walk in the way of knowledge and wisdom, and depart from the things that are not of the Lord. See, God just doesn't do whatever you want Him to do. He does His word. He will always perform His word, but if you reject His word, you're out there and in the land, the dry land, in trouble. The rebellious dwell in a dry land. You're going to get smit by the enemy. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, they're going to eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. You can choose your own way and get destroyed. Well, is God allowing that? He'll allow you to do anything you want because he's given you a choice. You can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose blessing or you can choose cursing. Does he want you to choose death or cursing? No, of course not. But he's given you a free will. He's not going to usurp authority over your will. You've got to choose the right way. The turning of the way of the simple will slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. They get, get their eyes off the Lord. But whoso hearkens unto me will dwell safely, and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. You won't be seeing all these things, these calamities, destructive things, and all these attacks that are coming through and causing devastation in your life and all this anguish and things that it says. God wants you to choose the fear of the Lord, choose the knowledge of God, choose to do what's right, hearken unto Him, be obedient to the Word of God, and set your will to choose what He wants. Amen. We see over in Romans chapter 1, verse 15, So as much as in me is, he says, what's ever, what so much as in me in? I am ready. This is a word which means ready and willing. I am ready and willing to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. You and I are to be in season, out of season, ready to preach the gospel. What are you here for? Remember, you're an ambassador for Christ. You're set forth. You are a pilgrim here. You're a stranger. This is not your home. You're a pilgrim sent to preach the gospel and to minister to other people. 
You need to be willing and ready to preach the gospel wherever you might go and to share the word of God with people. He wants you to be ready and willing to do this. We see also another thing, and we talked about this the last time. With your will, you must govern your mind. It's mandatory. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations. That means you cast down reasonings, anything going on in your mind. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, how would you know? Because you think about what the knowledge of God says. If you don't have the knowledge of God, you're in trouble. Because you'll just be following whatever comes in your mind. But you think about what the Word says, what give the knowledge of God. Now, if anything that exalts itself, raising itself above what the knowledge of God says, trying to get you to do that instead, you just ignore the knowledge of God, or don't, don't have it, or just throw it behind your back, you'll be in trouble. Bringing into captivity every thought. Every thought means every thought. To the obedience of Christ. And having a readiness, again, prepared and ready to, of revenge or to be able to uh, protect and defend yourself against all disobedience. What disobedience? The devil's attacks against your mind. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to make wrong choices by thinking wrong. When your obedience is fulfilled, that's how you conquer the disobedience that comes against you. But it but it's mandatory for you to cast down re mental reasonings, always think what the Word says, and never let anything take ascendancy over the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Another thing you need to choose to do. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We're foreseeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, Lay it aside. Lay aside just means put it off, put it away, anything that's weighing you down. And the sin that so easily besets us, you know, that sin that keeps on getting to you, you need to conquer that thing. And run with patience or steadfastness the race that's set before you. We're going to get our eyes off of all these things. And of course, the next verse says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The word looking, by the way, is quite an interesting word. Notice what it means below. Turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something. Meaning, I'm turning my eyes away from everything except for fixing them on the Word of God, fixing them on the Lord. Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If you keep your eyes on Him and you keep doing what He wants, you're going to walk in the right way. But you've got to choose the right things. Choose to lay these things aside. Matthew chapter 7. So you've got to set your will, see, that you're going to choose what God wants and obey Him. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even you even so to them. This is the law and the prophets. It's not really a good translation here. Translation. Young's brings it out. All things, therefore, whatsoever you may will, because this is not a helper verb for that. It's a subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement. And the way you would translate it may be continually willing, because it's present would be even better. Whatever you may be willing that men... And then when it says should do, it's really may be doing. Same thing, another subjunctive move with the present tense to you. Do, and this here, when he says do to them, he's given you a, a commanding statement here, the word do. This is an imperative mood. Otherwise, you do it. It doesn't matter what they do. You do what you would or want or willing to have people that they may do unto you. Now, does that mean that they automatically will do it unto you? No, because it's conditional for them as well. They may not. But you know, God will find somebody that will, because God will get things back to you. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Whatever you give out, it's going to be given back unto you. But many, many people say, well, I, thought, well, I did this to the men. He should have done it back to me. 
And that's not what the scripture says. Doesn't mean he's automatically going to do it. That he may be doing to you, if he's obedient, to God's word, doing what he should do. Nonetheless, you do to them. Remember, whatever you do, it's going to come back to you somehow. Because if we give out, it's always going to come back to us. See, you've got to make sure that you're choosing the right things. For instance, when people do wrong to you, what do you do? Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. You don't retaliate against enemies. You don't send curses to people. These people that, sent the, that teach this returning curses unto the sender, they are missed it totally. That's Old Testament. We aren't dealing with Old Testament. Our enemies, we aren't dealing with people. We're dealing with evil spirits. We don't return curses to people whatsoever. You don't do anything evil to someone who hates you or uses you or persecutes you. You love your enemies. You bless them. You do good. You pray for them. You give them what they have need of, but not what they deserve. Otherwise, you judge. You're in trouble. Judge not, lest you be judged. Furthermore, when you're giving out What's going to happen? It's going to come back to you. You give out love, love's coming back to you. Probably not from your enemies, but God will bring it back to you from someone else. You bless, you're going to get blessed. You do good, good's going to be done back to you. You pray, people will be praying for you as well. Because you're going to do the right thing. You've got to choose to do those things. And notice, when you do these things, that you may become, it's ginomai, not may be, that you may become, it's the word ginomai down here, which means become. That you may become subjunctive mood if you meet the, the, the conditions, which is doing what the verse said before, loving, blessing, doing good, praying for those. That you may become the sons, really. This is not children, it's the word huios, which really means the sons of your father. Remember, we're born again as a child, but then we grow up to become sons. We gave a message on that some time ago. There's a difference. Become sons of your Father, which is in heaven. Because you're going to grow up and do the things that God wants you to do. Otherwise, it's not automatic until we meet the conditions. Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, we pick up in verse 23. Certainly, we've got to set our will to do the right thing. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them all, if any man will, main verb in the phrase, as we see, he may will, it's an indicative mood, which is the mood of a reality or a factual statement. Come, what is come? It's an infinitive again. Here's the infinitive. That's why Young's translates it, will to come, is why Young's is outstanding. If any man will, may will, he's wills, may will to come after me. He set his will that he's going to come after me. That's what you need to do. You set your will that you are going to come after the Lord, and you're going to do the things that he says as he wants you to do. You're in present tense. So any man who is willing, setting his will essentially, to come after me, what's the first thing you do? Let him deny himself. You're to deny yourself. Again, it kind of waters it down when it says, let him deny himself. It's an imperative mood. It would be better translated, deny yourself. <laughs> Not let him deny himself. It kind of waters it down a little bit, like it's a good idea. Well, let him try to do this. No, deny yourself. That's what it's saying in the Greek. And take up your cross daily. That's also a commanding statement. So, if your will is set to come after him, if you don't meet these conditions, are you going to be able to be successful in coming after him? No. You'll just be doing your own way. You deny yourself. You take up your cross daily. And you are continually to be following him. Because again, this is imperative mood, as we see. Present tense. You're to be continually following the Lord. How do you do that? You're walking in line with the Word. 
And this word really, follow here, is a word which means you come, you're following him such to join him as a disciple, to become as a disciple. You're not just following him, just, you know, whatever you want to do. You're becoming a disciple. Remember, we're to make disciples of all nations. Every one of us are to become a disciple. Those are the ones that glorify the Father. So this is another thing with your will. If your will is set to come after the Lord, first thing, first thing is deny yourself. If you're still living unto yourself, you're going nowhere. You may be getting a lot of knowledge, but you're really not developing yourself in your relationship with the Lord. You're to deny yourself. Why do you have to take up your cross daily, crucifying something daily? What's to, what's to be crucified? The deeds of the body. You gotta put it to the death, all the deeds of the body. You can't be yielding to the deeds of the body. You're sinning left and right, and you're going nowhere. You're giving place to the devil. This is how people become religious. They have their form of religion, but it's no fruit, no victory, no, no nothing happening because they haven't met the conditions. They got, they're doing it their way. No. You set your will that you are going to come after him, which you must do, then you deny yourself. And you crucify that flesh daily, and you follow after him to become a disciple. Another thing you've got to realize, we mentioned this earlier, but here's another scripture that's important. You will have attacks from the enemy. I thought it was supposed to be smooth sailing when I got born again. No, you just started in the war. You're in the lifelong war <clears throat> because the devil hates everybody that's born again. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will, again, same main word, willing, in the word live here, infinitive, are willing to live godly. It means you've got to set your will that I'm going to live godly. You just don't happen to live godly. You live godly because you choose to live godly. You set your will to do it. You're going to do her the word. That's the way you're going to walk. Set your will that I am going to be godly. I will to be godly in Christ Jesus. That means you're a doer of the word. What's going to happen? Well, the devil's going to attack you left and right. You're going to suffer persecution. That's right. What's he trying to do? Remember, persecution is one of the things in the parable of the sower that's to take the word out of your heart and cause you, the word, not to produce fruit in you. Cause you to stand away in time of temptation or when the affliction or persecution comes. No. That's why you've got to resist it. You've got to conquer it. All those that live, God, live that will to live godly you're going to have persecution. Don't be moved by it. Just know it's going to happen. Too many people get upset when attacks come against them. That's a mistake. Don't get in the flesh and react in it. You just do what the Word says and walk in the ways of the Lord. Hebrews 13, 18. Praying for us, though, we trust that we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live. Again, the infinity, they got it right this time. Setting my will to live honestly, which really means beautifully, excellently, or well. Hey, well, I want to live an excellent way in the way of the Spirit. I want to live well. I want to live beautiful. Kalos means good in a sense of beautiful way before God. The right way. Which is obviously going to be according to the Word of God. You're going to live upright. You're going to live morally. You're going to live obedient to Him and do the things He wants. If you're also going to make the right choices, you're going to choose to refrain your tongue from any evil. 1 Peter 3.10 For he that will, he's willing, again, main verb again, present tense, to love, infinitive again, they just never translate these things right, unfortunately. I take the time to show you because I didn't pull this out of the air. I got it from the Greek, the truth. That's why will he so who is willing to love life and see good days? Meaning, just because I, I if just because I want to, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. I'm willing to love life and see good days. Uh, the, I'm going to have to do some things, aren't I? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Your tongue speaks words. You got to refrain your tongue from speaking evil. 
if you pour grace into your lips, God will bless you forever. That's a tremendous promise. If you don't know that scripture, it's over in Psalms 45, where it talks about your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. It's writing things in the realm of the Spirit. Thou art fair in the children of men. Grace is poured into your lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. If you can just get your tongue speaking the right thing, the blessings are coming on you forever. The problem with many is they don't get their tongue speaking the right thing. And no wonder. The enemy will have place. When you speak wrong words, you're going to give place to the devil, and he is going to work against you. That's why we've got to make the right choices at all times. Over in Matthew, chapter 19. Interesting what's being said here. <clears throat> this is this one guy, the rich guy, had all these goods. We come down here. Oh, this one is a, good, this is a different guy. Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Thinking that he could just do some good thing to have eternal life. He said, why callest me thou good? There's none good but one that's God. But if thou, now he's telling him, how are you going to enter into eternal life? But if thou will, willing to enter, Young's brings it out, same thing, into Zoe, the eternal life, what's the way? Keep the commandments. That means if we're not keeping the commandments of the New Testament, have we set our will to be able to enter into eternal life? No. Well, I'm willing to enter into eternal life. It doesn't matter unless you meet the conditions. you got to do what it says, which is what? Keep the commandments. That is exactly what needs to happen. And then in talking to this guy a little bit further, notice what he said now. Jesus said to him, if thou will, not will be perfect helper verbs, if you will, main verb again, if you are willing, present tense, to be, this is an infinitive again, there's the infinitive, if you're willing to be perfect, why would he say that? Because we're to go on to perfection. The ones that are in heaven are the ones who are righteous, having been perfected. We're going on to perfection. If thou are willing to, and what? Those are the ones that are going to be able to enter into eternal life. He's talking to the same, the guy. He said, hey, if you're going to have set your will to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. And now he's saying, if you're willing to be perfect, which is what you need to be also to enter into eternal life, go and sell that thou hast, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. What was his problem? He had an idol, money and possessions. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with having money and possessions as long as it doesn't have you. But he had possessions, and therefore that was an idol in his life. Get rid of your idol and come and be following me and become a disciple. That's the guy that's going to be, go on into perfection. And that's the, because he's keeping the commandments of the Lord, and he's going to be blessed of the Lord. Look at Matthew chapter 20, down here in verse 26. It shall not be so among you, but whosoever will, may will. Now this one again is the present tense subjunctive mood, meaning he may be willing to be, become, not be, become. It's the word ginemai. Who, uh, whosoever may be willing he meets the conditions, to become, again, we'll show you, it's an infinitive. There's the infinitive, you see. To be great among you, what's the answer? Let him be your minister, as it says. Or we missed the one thing here, here's the be. When it says, let him be your minister, again, it's watered it down again. <laughs> All these let me, you know, let this happen and stuff is kind of like, you know, if it, if it happens, it happens. No. It's an imperative mood. If you will, if you may be willing to be great, you, he says, be a servant. One who serves. 
That's the way. That's a command. We're to be, ser be a servant. Be a servant. Let him be a servant. You're to be a servant before God. God wants you to serve him and carry out the things he wants. In John chapter 7, we see another thing. In verse 17, and this, remember, is talking about when Jesus is coming up to tabernacles, if you remember when we taught about this, and he comes up in the middle of it, which is all revelation far as prophetically, that he is going to come in the end time church to bring forth the true doctrine and revelation so they grow up and walk in the ways of the Lord. And here he says, if any man wills, it says will do his will, you miss the whole boat again. If any man wills, subjunctive mood, conditional statement, present tense, the way you translate it, may will. To do, again, there's the infinitive, to be doing, present tense, continuous. So it would say, if any man may be willing to be doing his will. That's where you, see, you're supposed to be that. You are to be willing to do his will. If you're not willing to do his will, you go nowhere. Well, I just want to know his will, and I'll think about it. <laughs> you're in trouble. No. You must be ready to do what he reveals to you. Any man is, may be willing to be doing his will. Literally, it says, he shall know of the doctrine. He's going to get revelation. Otherwise, you don't just come to God to get a bunch of knowledge, and then you think about whether you're going to do it. No, that doesn't work. You submit yourself to God as He's coming, as He is. You set your will that you're going to do His will, the Word of God. God's going to bring revelation to you. I'm ready to do it. He'll know, you'll know of the doctrine, whether it's of God or whether it's of myself. God's going to bring revelation. What goes right along with this also is over in John chapter 3, in verse 21. It didn't say he who discovers or learns truth comes to the light. It says he that doeth truth comes to the light. Not just by hearing, but it's by doing it consistently. Present tense. That's why you've got to get committed. You set your will. You're going to do the word. That's it. As you do it, you'll come to the truth. That same thing is shown again. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, that's the conditional statement, then are you my disciples indeed. You're not a disciple unless you're continuing in the word. And then he says, and you shall know the truth. That means that follows that. You're going to know the truth because you become a disciple. How do you become a disciple? You're doing the word and you incorporate it into your lifestyle. And then what's going to happen? The truth shall make, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> make you free, set you at liberty, as we see. It's going to bring liberty and freedom and victory for you in your life. So, that means the guy who sets his will to do the word of God, he's going to be doing truth, he's going to get revelation. And as he does it, he's going to come to the place of being a disciple. He's going to know the truth. That's the guy that's going to get free. Not the guy that just wants to pray a prayer and get this problem off of me, or whatever. Or I'll find somebody to get this all off of me. That's ridiculous. That's what people are doing all the time. And they wonder why I'm not getting anywhere. It's doing the Word and walking in it. It's the whole package. God does a total, complete work in you. And you will come to the place of knowing the truth. And that truth will make you free. Because you are doing what He says continually. That's what God wants. In fact, it's really important, of course, for you to be a doer of the word, because look what it says over here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that, doesn't, that means everybody who's calling him Lord isn't going to enter. That means every born-again Christian is not going to be entering in. Who's going to do? Who's going to enter in? He that doeth. Present tense, continuous, repeated action. The will of my Father. Or as Young brings it out, who is doing the will of my Father which is in the heavens. 
Otherwise, being a doer of the word is the key. You just don't hear and not do. You don't just hear without the attitude that I'm going to do what he says. Otherwise, you're ready. Whatever he says, I'm ready to do it. Whatever I learn, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put it in operation in my life. That is someone who's submitted to God. That's someone who's living unto him. That's someone who is going to see God bring revelation to them. That's what he wants. Also, you have that kind of attitude. You're going to be ready to do everything that God wants you to do. In fact, look what the psalmist says down here in Psalms 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will. I take pleasure in doing thy will, O God, oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I'm, I want to do it. I'm ready to do it. That means there'll never be any attitude of begrudgingly doing it. I have to do that, or I ought to do that, or I don't know if I want to do that or not. No, you haven't got your will set. If you get your will set, I'm going to do the right thing, you will delight to do the will of God because the law of God will be within your heart and God will be, you'll be glorifying him and he is going to be manifesting himself greatly in your life. And that is what he wants. That brings us to a couple other important points. Isaiah, chapter 65. As you are setting your will to do what he wants you to do and obey the word of God, can you walk after your own thoughts? No. Isaiah 65, verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. How does he define someone that's a rebellious people? Which walk into the way that was not good after their own thoughts. Meaning, if you walk after your own thoughts, you're rebellious. If you walk after your own thoughts, you walk in a way that's not good. That means, what am I supposed to do with these thoughts? I'm supposed to submit them to God. If they're of the Lord, do them. If they're not of the Lord, you cast it down. You bring it into captivity, the obedience of Christ. You revenge the disobedient thoughts that are trying to get to you. And with your mind, thinking on what the Word says, you choose to do what God wants you to do. That's how you live. How many Christians out there are living this way? They should be. Everybody should be living this way. You, you know, don't walk after your own thoughts. As long as you're walking after your own thoughts, God says we are rebellious. That's quite an earth-shaking statement to many people. Isaiah 65, verse 12. The latter part of this, he says, You did choose that wherein I delighted not. If you choose the wrong thing, are you going to be blessed? No. You're going to shut down God. He's not going to be able to do anything for you whatsoever. You did, when I spake, you didn't hear. You did evil before my eyes. Didn't choose the things that I delighted, delighted not in. We need to choose the things that God wants. And we can't be choosing to walk in sin. What happens if you choose to walk in sin? <laughs> Hebrews 10 makes it pretty clear. Because you didn't set your will to do the right thing. Look what it says in Hebrews 10, 26. If we sin willfully, we know what we're doing. After we have received the precise, correct knowledge of the truth, we know the word. We know exactly what it says. There remains no more sacrifice for sins to get out of it, but a fearful looking for judgment and fiery nation will devour the adversaries. Well, I'll just confess my sin real quick and everything will be fine. Well, that's good, but you still have the effects of your sin. You say, well, how could that be? Well, let me give you an example. You commit fornication, you know it's wrong, but you willfully went in and did it. I confess my sin real quick. I repent and got right with God. How about the effects of your fornication? I remember a particular case of a person who did that and they got the AIDS virus. And after they confessed their sin, it wasn't gone because the effects of their sin was there. But they had to learn, they, they really had true repentance. They had to cast out the demons. God could turn things around. He can, but you still have the judgment that comes in. 
the judgment's going to come if we walk, are willingly doing what is wrong and walking in the ways of sin. <laughs> you can't just confess your sin real quick and, ah, oh, it's all gone and everything's great. No. <laughs> that person learned it for sure. Now they had all these problems. Think of how many people have gotten all kinds of problems from sexual sin. The sexual sins out there in the world is rampant in all the diseases we're talking about. It's rampant, all the things that have happened. We've got to choose the way of the Lord and make the right choices and do the things that he wants us to do at all times. Another thing, we must be ready to do the right thing and not ready to get all upset and want to judge somebody. We already talked about that once, but look at what it says here in Luke chapter 9, verse 54. His disciples, James and John, saw this and said, Lord, wilt thou, are you willing, is your will, that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Let's get rid of them, even as Elias did. <laughs> he turned and rebuked him and said, you know no what manner of spirit you are of. You're the devil otherwise. Are we supposed to be doing that? No. We're supposed to be loving our enemies and blessing those that curse us and praying for those, right? Not bringing this thing. He said, the Son of Man's not come to destroy a man's life, but to save him. We want to call him to repentance. God will seek him. He's long-suffering, not willing any should perish. Not smite him and finish him off. <laughs> That's a wrong spirit. We cannot be judgmental and have these kinds of attitudes. Judge not, or you are going to be judged. We can't allow that. Set your will that you're always going to do what God wants you to do. Luke chapter 10, verse 29. Let's go back up a little bit. This is the guy who was saying about the lawyer comes and says, hey, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And he's always thinking of the big picture here. And he says, well, what's written in the law? How readest thou? He says, well, I'm going to love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, strength, mind, and neighbor as thyself. That's right. Thou hast answered right, this do and you'll live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Does that mean everybody? Or can I just you know, eliminate some of these people that I can not walk in love toward? He's willing to justify himself. No, it was a mistake on his part. Otherwise, he was not going to do what the word said for everybody because he was trying to justify himself. Uh, we can't do that. We've got to be no, no respecter of persons and carrying out the things that God wants us to do at all times in our life. We see another thing <coughs> in John chapter 6. We've got to put the word first place and choose the way of the Lord. If you don't and the devil gets to you, you could go backwards. Look what it says here. John 6, 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were disciples. Take heed, lest anybody think they can fall. I mean, they, they can't fall. Anybody could fall. And said Jesus unto the twelve, he says, well, you go away too? Are you guys leaving also? Will you also go away? Is your will set to go away? No. You set your will that you're going to follow him. It doesn't matter what happens. You are going to follow the Lord all the days of your life. Of course, what was the problem with these guys? And remember, and ended up in the wilderness and died all out. What did they always want to do? Acts 7.39, To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust them from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. They always wanted to go back into Egypt. They didn't want to follow God's way. That's a person who doesn't want to follow the word. They just want to follow the way of the world because Egypt is a type of the world. They want to do other things. They don't want to follow the word. God wants you to put the word of God first place in your life. It's absolutely mandatory. Choose to do what he wants you to do. First Peter chapter 4, verse 2 that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. 
We're not going to live to any time about the lusts of the flesh whatsoever. For the time past of our life may suffice to have wrought the will of the, the Gentiles, or the will of the nations, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries. No. We got to set our will that we're going to live to the will of God. We're going to do all the things that God wants us to do. That is so important. And see what happens if you don't walk in the ways of the Lord. You're giving place to the devil, and he's going to come in. In fact, he can take you captive at his will. You mean the devil can get me? That's right. 2 Timothy 2, 25, meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God prevents, will give them a repentance to the acknowledging or come to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who, has to, who are taken captive by him at his will, the devil's will. That means when you give place to sin, the devil has the will and the choice and he can come in and take you captive because you've given place to him. And that is exactly what happened. So what are we to do? God wants you and I to put the Word of God first place. Two important scriptures that we need to look at. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, now much more in my absence, work out present tense, continuous repeated action, your own salvation with fear and trembling. That means we continually are doing And this, by the way, is an imperative mood as well. He's commanding you and me, be working out your salvation with fear and trembling. How do you do it? Always obeying. Always obeying. And then what's happening? God's at work in you to both the will and the do of his good pleasure. See, these people that have said, well, it sounds like you're saying we're going to be saved by works. So we can't do anything by works. No, we're not saying that at all. What are we saying? We are to work out our own salvation by doing the word, which does what? Puts God in operation to perform it in our life. In other words, God's doing the work. How's he doing the work? Because we're doing the word. Can he do the work if we don't do the word? No. So we have a work, what, a work of faith that puts him in operation. Is that our own works? No, it's his works. We're doing his works. Essentially, his word to put him in operation. So many people have been deceived by this. In fact, we must obey him if we're going to see God accomplish the salvation of the Lord in our life. Because look what it says. Speaking of Jesus, being perfected, more literally, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? To all those that are born again? No. To all them that obeyed him once in their life? No. To all them who, present tense verb, are obeying him. That's why Young's brings it out. To all those obeying him. That's ongoing. That means if you're not obeying him continually, is he gonna, are you going to see the eternal salvation come? Nope. See, we've got to know the truth of these things and walk in the ways of the Lord. Remember, we talked about this the last time, but we've got to bring it up again. Judgment is coming to the church before it comes to the world. Everybody's waiting for Jesus to come back and get us out of here. It's a lying teaching from the devil. The judgment is coming to the church first before it comes to the world. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if at first, first in time and place, begin at us. That's right. What shall be the end of those not obeying? They're not obeying. The gospel of God, present tense. Well, they're in trouble. And remember, we have pressure that comes against us. If the righteous scarcely, the word scarcely means with difficulty and not easily. Meaning, it's not going to be clear sailing. You're going to have to resist the enemy, conquer the temptation, the persecution, the attacks, pressure from the enemy. 
be saved. Oh, they're already saved. No, it doesn't say that. These guys that did the translations, they're in trouble. They are really in trouble. It's a present tense verb. It would be translated, if the righteous, with difficulty and not easily, are being saved. That's the present tense. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, that shows you the fact that that's why we're working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's an ongoing process, isn't it? Of seeing this happen. You're saved as long as you're staying with the Lord and following Him. Remember, God looks at you at any time by what you're walking at at any time. Remember the guy who turned away and says, well, I'm not going to walk in his ways anymore. We're going to follow lawlessness. He says, depart from me. Or the guy's a worker of righteousness. I don't know you. Otherwise, the way you're walking at any point in time is the key. Just stay on the road of the Word of God, and you're fine. People say, well, how do I know if I might not make it? Just stay on the road of following the Word of God, you're fine. You're saved, and you'll stay saved. And you're working your salvation out. Get off track, you're in trouble. You don't ever want to get off track whatsoever. And one last scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And we finished with this the last time. Verse 9. To this end did I also did I write that I might know the proof of you. What's the proof of you? What's the, I like that one part, tried character. The proving of the character, the, the, whether you're the real deal, basically. Whether you be obedient in all things. In your obedience, you show you're following the Lord. In your obedience, you show you have the fear of God. In your obedience, you show you're the real thing. You're a real disciple. You're really following the Lord. Obedient, not just in a few things. Obedient in all things. That's what he's saying to the Corinthian church. Remember, he had a lot of problems with those guys. Those guys had all kinds of problems. He's correcting them after thing, after thing, after thing. Someday we'll go through the Corinthians and show all the different things where they were messing up on. He was coming to correct them on all these things. Try to get them straight. And now in this second letter, he's saying, are you being obedient in all the things? Oh, they were a problem. God wants you and I to be obedient in all things and do everything that he wants us to do. In fact, I said we're going to quit there, but we had to look at this scripture. Look at this scripture. This is quite a scripture. Whosoever shall do, not a future tense, subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement, might do, because it's aorist tense, just a straight statement, Whoever might do, if you do it, the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. Meaning, who's the family of God? The ones who are doing the will of God. Not someone who just signed on the dotted line, got born again, and then he's walking in the flesh, or walking in lawlessness, or walking in unrighteousness, or doing whatever he wants. No. It's all lying teaching from the devils. Deceive the entire body of Christ. What a mess. That's why we got to put out the truth. I tell you, anybody that doesn't look up the Greek on all these things and see these things, they are sunk before, they're in trouble before the Lord because everybody who teaches the Word, they have the greater condemnation if they don't bring it forth accurately in truth. We have to be exactly precise, correct knowledge. Hey, we're going to be, the brother and the sister and mother, that's the family of God. Hey, we're going to be a part of the family because we're going to do the will of God. We're going to meet the conditions and carry out and do the word of God. That is what God wants. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation and commands that I am to choose the way of the Lord. I set my will that I will choose to obey the Word of God in all things. I deny myself. I crucify the flesh daily. I am following the Lord in obedience to His command continually to become a disciple. As I continue in the Word, doing the Word, I will know the truth. The truth will make me free. 
I set my will that I am going to do the Word of God continually. And I thank you that I will see the blessings of God come forth. I will be a fa- part of the family. I will come to perfection. I will be entering into eternal life. I will enter into the kingdom. All these things we've seen. I will meet the conditions. I set my will to do all the things that the word of God says so that I will walk with him and I will see all the blessings come forth in my life. So Heavenly Father, I set my will this day to do the word of God all the days of my life and be obedient in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that everyone has ears to hear and they will understand the importance of this message and the things that are declared in the Word of God. Thank you that we will do it. We will set our will to obey the Word and we will walk with you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. We got lots more things to talk about as we're talking about many different subjects that are showing us our way on to perfection in the Lord to become a part of the glorious church, of course, conquering every enemy, overcoming in everything, and seeing God accomplish his great work in our life. And we got more to talk about on other things coming up this Sunday. Praise the Lord. Hope you will be here to hear it. If you need prayer, I invite you to come forward. Be obedient in all things. Set your will. And don't let anything in your mind that you don't cast down if it's not of the Lord. And set your will to do what God wants in everything you do. You're on your way to a great victory in your life. God bless. You need prayer. I invite you to come forward. Have a great week as you are doing the will of God, obedient in all things. God bless.